call the meeting to order and then to get to a roll call. Looks like Josh is on here. Uh, we have Arthur Sorkin. Here. Josh Shansky. Here. Jeff Hoffman. Here. Jeff Hoffman. Here. Jeff Hoffman. Here. Um, and then have Kelly Lewis and Sarah Arty. Here. Okay. Okay. Um, so we need to take a look at the minutes from the June 11th, 2024 meeting. Um, I have read through them. I haven't been to the other one. I don't know if anybody wants to see them. Okay. I need a motion to approve. Okay. Okay, Glenn move, carry second it. Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, minutes of scrutiny. Is there anybody from the public that would just love to be heard this morning? Okay. All right. So, Melissa's pretty well introduced herself. Errol, did you want to have her say a little bit more? Or are you yeah, kind of a little bit, but yeah, if you wouldn't mind. No, no, no. Um, actually, we might be past. Um, yeah, you're familiar. We will probably meet a lot of people, so expect it. Um, my name is Melissa Berry. I'm sorry for repeating some of this stuff. Um, I've been a uh, long time resident since 2005. I've been in the Sunset area. Um, I'm a city player by profession. I work for the city of Lafayette. I've been a very small housing company. And, uh, with that, I was a new developer here. I'm going to see you. We're going to go to Pennsylvania. I'm going to get consulted. That's safe, right? Right. So, in the resilient tent, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, where are you with? I was with um, Vincent Subjects that got acquired by MIT. Yeah. Okay. That's right. That was when we did Blueprint. Yep. Same thing, Blueprint. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you said you're planning to see a lot of So you're involved in the Unity Project? Yeah. yeah. Um, you want to just take a minute to talk oh, about that? Sure. Because that is a housing authority. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's a reported county housing authority. Mm -hmm. um, but it's actually a partnership between the, um, the county housing authorities in the and with the county. Um, they came together about 2017. It was a property that um, was going to have like a low drop, <laughs> and they decided to take a different spot. So the uh, city and uh, I believe it was the city that approached the county and the CHA um, to help acquire the property. Boulder um, County has a lot of legal pockets, so it's in Lafayette, so they went up and bought the property. Um, CDA Lafayette's paying them back. Um, and then ECHA was going to be the developer and the manager of the housing. It's four hundred units. Um, it's a mix of apartments, um, townhomes, duplexes, and one of the So there are a variety of different um, multi family. Um, and one is a senior town, um, it's a 62 unit senior town with that is the 9% of the money. Um, and then a uh, couple of the nine classes in the public and all that. Four percent. And then, um, yeah, there are other construction, phase one's under construction. Uh, that's the majority of infrastructure, the senior building, the community building, two nine classes, and two public families. Uh, they are just starting to do the uh, planning for phase two, which is mostly town homes. So they're also going to have. Properties to own as well, right? Like yes. Um, the duplexes, they're, they've designed it to try to transition into the more um, the, um, denser areas of the multifamily. Black has to be low density. So, what they did is they, they put the duplexes around the edge so that we kind of stepped in and more um, uh, denser, wide so the, um, so the, the duplexes on the um, perimeter of um, Sale. A for sale affordable. It's, uh, it's all affordable. They do have a clause that says that they had to, for the sake, put um, some of the markets in. They have a few that they could do that, but they're trying not to. Um, and then, what else is going to say about it? Um, and it's affordable for the community, right? Yes, right. Yeah. 
yeah, that's part of the agreement. Um, and it's, it's, I think you guys know that's kind of a weird thing that we were doing with these kind of things, but, um, but yeah, so that is the, um, that is the intention. Um, and then um, it, it is a net zero um, developer's capacity. So on the geothermal, uh, solar panels, uh, RTD, all stuff is going to be rebounded into it. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think it's going to be awesome. Exactly. It's the goal for leasing off of the new thing. It sounds like a pretty early infrastructure, yeah. but. Well, um, they would like to get CEOs by the end of the year and they probably could do that. It's just, um, as a city, we have to figure out how to do that yeah. in keeping them on safety and the offer of it. Because it will be moving south to the other phase, which is to make sure that they're completely done with that phase before we go back to the event. Just for safety's sake. But yeah, they hope to start leasing by the end of the year. They are a little behind because of the property. Yeah, yeah. 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 They are a little behind because of the. Um, I'm just. Just actually. Sometimes I'm sad. So, um, and then also the process. Um, not yet, needs to be done. We all recognize it. We need to get a more um, straightforward process. Um, our PDD, if we hope we can do new stuff. Those are brand new developments. They tend to be kind of um, not as aggressive. You don't just go into the code and say, I need everything. It's more like I'm a group sheet. It's all. So it took longer than we did. So, so Thank you for sharing. So we're going to kind of jump in there. Open unless Harold wanted to talk about any of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, I can. Um, Lauren and I are supposed to tag team it because we're in budget. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will uh, we'll give you the this. So we're kind of at the LHA organization. Yeah, so I can do that. Okay. We'll take that. So I think I've done this with you all. So I'm going to do a Reader's Digest version um, for Melissa and then if there's any questions. Um, or if you all have any questions, because we forgot to update you on this, I'll, we'll jump in. Um, Arlene is on, I think you're now the longest tenured on the Housing Authority Board. Thank you for not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I think it was you, Lauren, actually, and uh, Tom, that was part of the board when who's part of this stuff, or it came on just after it. Um, so, where we kind of... Hit the color drop buttons. Yeah. Yeah. As you say. 
Okay, Josh. I have you on speaker. Can you hear us now? Yeah. 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 Is that better? Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, and I'll kind of move it around a little bit, just holler if you can't hear. Okay. And if you run out of battery, we had a phone in here somewhere, so we were going to That's good. That's fine. Um, so, uh, this all started probably actually six or seven years ago. Um, when we were, um, we had a series of unfortunate events occur uh, related to the city property, where um, this was prior to the city engaging in the housing authority. Uh, but we had some challenges there. We began talking to the housing authority about different issues related to the use of drugs, selling of drugs, other things. And, um, the housing authority at the time had an assistant director, assistant manager. They began working with our police department to look at doing training exercises with their canine units. Um, and they did not post anything in the building about training exercises. And so uh, they did that work and then it blew up on us. Uh, blew up on them. From an operational standpoint, we were up on us because the nine units were involved in that. So we went through a series of actions. Um, not long after that, um, uh, the council was really starting to engage in the housing authority operator with the board and understanding what was going on. The city actually made the decision to uh, settle. Um, so they began. So the tenants that sued both the housing authority and the city, which they were represented by the ACLU, we made a decision to settle before there was even a lawsuit. So it just, it wasn't, the, we did not do the right thing. Um, housing authority did not do that. So we kind of get through this. Um, not long after that, um, the Times called it a series of stories about, you know, what was the biggest story in long time. And um, the housing authority director at the time and staff participated in activity because it was ironically associated with the Olympics. And they created this Olympic podium and had a picture of him standing in a gold medal spot because it was the biggest story in Longmont. And somebody would take those pictures of the time spot. So the, the mayor at the time uh, was like that. And he said to the board, you either want me to deal with this or I'm going to go you. So the board terminated <coughs> that position. At that point, their staffing levels were pretty low. Um, they brought in the interim, a retired housing authority director from Loveland. Uh, then they brought, then they had Jillian, who came in, uh, and she was from the Northeast, I believe. Subsequently, after that, um, they started seeing the financial issues that they were having as an organization. Um, the chair and vice chair approached uh, their council of liaison, saying we need the city involved. So then they all began approaching us. I think that's about the time our name was starting to join, or we joined right after that. And and basically they were uh, on the road to being financially insolvent. Um, Staffing was minimal at best, and there were just a load of challenges going on. So, in that agreement, uh, the city council agreed to bring to appoint me, I think, at the time, as what they called an operating director, which, mean, which meant that I was, a, I was on the board of directors, but I was in charge of operations. Um, we we did go through an iteration to where eventually said this isn't going to work. We needed the council to become the housing board board, and then this board became the advisory board for the city council uh, because it just mimicked the city structure more than it was. It was just problematic, and we were given some really odd conflict of interest showing up that we had to be pretty careful with. So that's the structure we're in today. Um, 
to give you kind of the lay of the land, um, they were in pretty bad shape. You know, we were talking to the Housing Authority Board and the City Council that they were probably close to receiver, you know, put under receivership by HUD. Um, sure enough, a year and a half after we took over, HUD said, yeah, we were about to call it. To step in and take over. So we were, we were there. They had a voluntary compliance agreement that we actually, as a city, helped them negotiate with HUD because of failure to process reasonable accommodations, not following their housing rules. Um, so they had that in place. And, and what we realized financially that was going on is that the um, between the director and the chief financial officer of the housing authority, they were probably eating about um, three hundred and seventy-six thousand of their annual operating budget, um, which is, you know, the housing authority directors are making around. It depends, but close to that. And then, but the reality was they weren't putting into their stuff. So basically, we came in and we brought a number of people from our organization into play. Let's start here now, actually. Uh, Michelle Lake here in Ronnie, Captain Bedwick, Molly, um, Sarah, Carmen Ramirez, um, who else there? Jim Golden, the city's chief financial officer, Joni Marsh, and Sam DC. Half of them, a little more than half, are retired now. So we went through this process, um, and then we just incrementally started ejecting city people. So the housing authority actually was able to. Um, what we did is we started repurposing uh, funds, so we could actually be more targeted in terms of the positions that we were hiring and actually pay them a market rate. So, for example, now the housing authority pays ten percent of my salary. Not, they're not my salary, but pays the city for ten percent of my salary, but not my direct salary. It goes into an additional profit. Same for Molly. Um, and and so we ended up charging the housing authority, let's say, around one hundred and fifty-ish thousand dollars for the work that we were all doing, plus ETS, purchasing, risk management, human resources. Um, so the 376, or let's say 350, they were pretty hard. 350, 110 at the time came out. So we pushed the remaining money back into the, the staff. And so we were able to elevate compensation for all the property managers and the maintenance crews, um, and what we started seeing is that it really started making a very clear distinction in terms of what uh, the caliber of people that we were hiring. And um, and so that was a big part of, of the restructuring process as we went forward. One of the things that I told the council at the time, so at the, at the same time when the housing authority was pretty stagnant, and uh, they were building a couple of projects, just before we took over, they had a project Fall River uh, that was in place. Um, it was getting ready to get financed, and with all of this happening, basically the solvency, they didn't have enough money to close on the project. So the city went in and actually purchased the property surrounding the suites with affordable housing funds for $750,000. We took a 60% ownership state control interest you know, uh, controlling interest in that, and in order for fall over to be completed. Um, so we talked to the city council, and we talked to the housing authority board, and we said, you know what, we're not, we don't think we're going to be building projects for three to five years, because of what it was going to take to really stabilize the housing authority. About a year and a half later, um, they were moving so fast that we started going, well, we get an opportunity, let's do it. So that's when Chris comes to you forward. And we entered into a partnership with MGL Partners, and um, it was more of a financing structure that we were part of. But what we did is we renegotiated Chris one and Chris one two as part of that deal. And so that was our first. Um, 
public private partnership that we entered into. So in about four more years, three or four more years, that entire property will transfer to the council. So we put, let's say, two and a half million into it. I can't remember the exact number. We're going to get $60 million worth of assets at the time in seven years, and we'll take over um, management of that property. Um, shortly after that, that's when um, Zenia started showing itself. And we had already, as a city, started negotiating with the um, element on that property because we were we had it before the city owned it before the city took over the housing authority. So we had to actually bring up a different partner to do something. So uh, Zenia goes through the development process and that's fifty five permanent supported housing units to add to the eighty five that we already have um, at the suites. Um, we won't have an ownership interest in that, but we have a contract for management of uh, uh, the app. Then we put out our third project, which is um, a Santa, what's it called? Over crossing. Over crossing. Um, and that's a Penrose Builder, and that's a, a little more similar to. Um, it's kind of a cross between Zinni and Christian in that um, we, we are in the ownership interest of that project. That's going to be around 85 um, units. The difference in, you know, the big difference for us is thus far in the Housing Authority's portfolio, we only have one property that's family, non acre restricted or non restricted, and that's Aspen Meadows neighborhood. Um, that's what, 30 units? Uh, so, we would have been talking to the board about the need to actually have more non restricted affordable housing because the rest of our portfolio is either permanent supportive housing or age restricted housing. So, Christmas kind of dabbling in that. Um, and then the Senate over is fully, yeah, we're not dabbling, we're fully engaged. And so that's going to be about 85 units of one, two, three, and four bedroom affordable units. Um, and that's going to include early child care as part of this. And so we are hopefully going to close in a couple of weeks and then start construction. And so that will be opening hopefully at the end of 25. So, uh, short story is. Really had to work organizations, had to work financials, but then really move into development because development is such an essential part of the financials for housing authority because that is part of the ongoing operating revenue from development that you get as a developer. Uh, and what happened was is when they stopped doing that, that really kind of put attention on their financials. So financially, where we are now looking at the budget is. Um, Kendra did some work where we now have, um, for the first time in the organization's history, we're looking at fund balances and where the fund balances are going to be uh, 10 years out. And so I can see now what the fund balance is, what the development revenue is coming in. And so now we're starting to target projects three, four, or five years out to hit certain cycles so we don't overwhelm our project managers. At the same time, we're cycling with the developer revenues uh, because we want to hold a minimum uh, fund balance, but we also want to have more than that as we're looking at it so that we can carry over additional projects. Um, so financially, I think we're drastically different than we're looking at. <laughs> you know, I think we're in a drastically different position and um, you know, so we're starting to, to look at that another project. Um, and part of that project is, um, and I can't get into too much detail because this is a public meeting. This project will be a little bit different and it's really dependent on the Prop 1B funding. So, you know, from Lafayette's perspective, all the cities are coming in and saying we want um, directed funding uh, that goes to the city so we can use the funding based on the project pipelines coming in. 
<clears throat> we're looking at a project where if we can get that directed funding, uh, we can actually take a different financing approach and look at either using um, COPs or using revenue bonds, but using the directed funds on an annual basis to help cover your debt ratio that you believe about plus the 1.2, 1.3 of these projects. And the reality is if we can blend that funding structure, whether it's that project or another one, that in about seven years, I don't know, a, we're going to get about $800,000 in off of developer revenue. In about seven years, that starts spinning off about, let's say, 600000 And then it very quickly ramps up to seven digits of money that comes into the, uh, the fund, which then dramatically changes what we're going to do. Uh, and then at the same time, when you get about year 10 or year 12, your equity that you have in that then lets you issue debt in a similar way that they actually cover as a covered ratio. So now we're starting to get a little bit more creative, and but we need to have that stability. Um, one of the things that the council gave me as one of my goals for this year was actually to hire more as the assistant. Um, well, they said hired assistant director. And so we hired Warren as an assistant director. Um, I would say, um, and, and Warren doesn't know this, so I'll just say it to all of you. But uh, I'll say in front of her, I, I, I've had um, several staff members approach me from all ACB, uh, from property management, and saying, Warren is the best choice you could make. And so, um, when, you, when, you, when you hear your staff say that, and the people they're supervising, uh, that's a good sign. But from my perspective, selfishly, we were talking about it. And when, when they were telling us that, Erica and I were saying, it's also made a dramatic difference in our lives. Um, because we went from just feeling overwhelmed with normal city manager stuff to Every day we have four or five residents that we're calling and everything. So, you know, we're in a really good trajectory now. Lauren has a development experience. We just need to get the management, the property management experience because um, I've been pretty open with, I think, you all and with our housing, like the council and the housing board, really is this is a position that we get here and we get the funding. You know, I wanted to be um, really more the director of the housing authority and I became like the ex officio kind of, or whatever it is, looking at more of the broader funding and, and still teaching as you know this. And what we've clearly figured out is it needs to be connected with the city. And the director, however this is in a year or two, needs to report into the city to have that structure. Because we've seen a lot of times where this happens. So it's not unusual for cities to come in and take over housing authorities. It's unfortunately more common than anybody probably realizes. It's not so not it's also not uncommon to see them take it over, straighten it out, push it out, and then have them take it over and straighten it out. Um, similar to what happened. Boulder County went through that, Boulder County went through that, Fort Collins has gone through that. So we're all pretty clear it needs to stay, but we're getting better at making its own true operating divisions. And so that's sort of the long term. And I don't know if you all got that before, but that's kind of where we're heading. And it's a good idea when we transition to refresh ourselves. Um, because it's getting closer, but we're getting close to making some other decisions. So uh, some of these projects are key to that. That's the problem, so. Hopefully my role, and it's getting that way now, is just more sitting there advising, teaching, problem solving, and then being able to work at a higher level in terms of financing and that. So, but it's kind of, it is great. So does that lead to the Pardon? So, I just want to say thank you because 
so it's nice to get that refresher and you know hear it again. But <clears throat> also, what I am hearing from the residents is that they're very pleased with one. The communication is really good, and it's also going to open. And that is true because I've sat in on a lot of meetings. Mm -hmm. So yeah, going forward. Yeah. And, and it's hard, I mean, when we talked about it, it was hard for Molly and I to deal with the issues that you had to deal with, but then you couldn't, you didn't have the capacity to then feel like and just watch and assess. And I think that's what's helping a lot is, you know, there's some tag teaming kind of coming in and, you know, Lauren can see things and then kind of talk to me and I can kind of go, well, what about this, this, or this? Or, Oh, we need to bring this person. So, yeah, I'm hearing that. I mean, the calls into our office are pretty much stopped. That's it. And that's your biggest gauge on how are, how are folks working is when, yeah, everybody happy now. Mm -hmm. No one will ever be happy. They still have issues when people aren't happy. Um, the difference is, is it, it, I think we have a better understanding of things to it. But yeah, no one will ever be happy. So, in, in, the, um, in the world of tag teaming this, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Lauren now because I'm in the middle of budget. Um, and, and I will tell you that there, I and mean, this is probably one of the most challenging budgets I've had. Uh, I wasn't here here in LA, but I had a budget for my life city in LA. And this budget's going to be different for us because the, the legislation that was passed um, regarding property tax is, I mean, we're trying to figure out how different cities are handling it because there's, some, there's, some, there's not a lot of clarity in this state. But basically, uh, property tax revenue is coming in flat to last year. So if you look at our three major revenue sources, sales and lease tax and then property tax, uh, what it really means is it's a decrease in revenue as we look at inflation and some other expenses. Um, so <clears throat> I will tell you that in one of my proposed budgets, what you're going to see is um, me shifting some things. Um, so I'm still going to fund an attainable housing fund, but instead of having the 650, and this, I'm telling you all this because it's touching your world and I don't have a chance, is part of my proposal is to use one-time funds versus the ongoing funds, which is 650000 that we have, because that wants me to place it in to the four services that we need to manage. And then I'm likely to take up a million ongoing in the affordable housing fund of 300000 to one month and um, replace that on the ongoing side in uh, affordable housing. So at the end of the day, it means nothing different. It's just the source of funding that I'm shifting. That would have means that you're going to learn to core operating expenses that really need that, and then we'll have to take that off the top. But, um, we're, we're, we're in it, at this kind of scene, we're in it, we kind of now trying to, to balance everything out, but this, um, that property tax legislation is impacting us, and we're trying to figure out will they backfill it, will they not backfill it, because it's not clear, um, so we're trying to talk to other places, but, um, I don't know if other cities are paying attention to this, but we are, because, uh, finally, we have that legislation coming. There's two items on the ballot in the paper. Either one of those passes, and it's an even more significant issue for local governments um, uh, because that will further reduce property tax, which at the end of the day, I mean, that's about parks, you know, all the court services that we have. There's not a lot to talk about it, but we're definitely seeing that it's going to be an impact. So, um, we'll see. But we'll, 
won't make a big difference to the affordable and sustainable housing funding. At the end of the day, it will be a difference in terms of where it's coming from. And I could change in and out. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'll do my best. What did I get? Can I add anything tonight? Can I add something? So, to add the Herald's, um, so how I'm here. So, I'm a police officer. I'm with the Public Safety Unit. Um, I've ran our Treasury Housing Program since 2010. So, I've worked with, uh, so myself and my work partner, we have about 230 properties in Longmont. So, we split those amongst each other. Um, I've always had LHA since 2010. Um, so, we work pretty intricately with that group for some time until there were some of the issues that Harold spoke with you about. Um, is that his phone? No, no that's right. Like, yeah. yeah. um, this is Josh, anyway. This is on that iPhone. Got it. Um, oh, okay. So, kind of stepped back um, from working with LHA through the, the trying time just because there was a lot of, um, from my end, didn't seem like they were wanting to participate in the program at the beginning. Um, once, the, once the city took over, um, you know, they started hiring property managers and all that. I just saw nine day difference when the city took over, he used to say. So, um, Carol and Molly um, brought me on, and so, so they, I believe they paid, LHA pays part of my salary um, to basically be their public health and safety person for properties and staff. So, provide education to staff, um, obviously work with the residents on issues, work with the board now a lot, with all, all the things. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to add that in, how and why I'm here. Yeah. I don't know. Melissa and I working, when I worked with PCHA as a developer, I'm really Lafayette, and I knew she lived here in Longmont, and so when I took this job, I was like, hey, by the way, by the way I'm going to have to step down from the board, and you should apply. So, I thought the role was pretty open. <laughs> <laughs> so, awesome. um, um, all right, so it looks like we need to walk to board chair. Do we have enough people to do this? Yes. Okay, good. So, um, so we need to elect the board chair. I would actually like to nominate Josh. Josh, are you there? Josh, can you hear us? Uh oh. It's still on. No, it's not on yet. Josh, can you hear us? If you don't respond, you're going to end up all the time. I didn't switch your kind of model and I didn't work to read that on my video now. Yeah, sorry. We just got nominated to be the chairman of the board, so. You need to hear this part. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> I appreciate the consideration. I honestly, uh, I've had some changes recently here at work that are, I've got to work through to figure out what uh, meetings I can reschedule to make this meeting on a more regular basis. Um, this is new as of last week that I was uh, selected to become the main CFO, uh, essentially affected immediately. And so I will, um, I've got a lot of transition to happen in a very short period of time. And one of the, you know, if it's scheduling conflicts or one thing just that I need to work through, um, if it weren't for that, I would happily accept the uh, nomination, but I don't know that I am the right person right now to fill that role. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm nominated, Arlene, if you're interested. Um, <laughs> just because you do, I mean, as we talked about, you've got the most experience here of the rank and file board members, and you do a great job of reaching out to residents and um, you know, just doing a lot more than just being here at these meetings. So, if it's something that you would like, I would nominate you. 
well, I don't have a problem with it unless somebody else is jumping up and down to take it. But then we'll need to have a vice chair with the house. Yeah. <clears throat> so so that one nomination having a it's just the motion. So, you want to make the first motion? I will. I want to make the motion um, to nominate Arlene as our board chair. Oh, he's a minute. I think we need a second, right? Yeah, we need a second. Okay, second. Okay. Hi. 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 Hi, Arlene. <laughs> That's an enthusiastic eye. I heard that. I heard that. Okay. So now we need to go with the co-chair, uh, vice chair, and the vice chair, I guess. Well, okay. I will nominate Carrie. Is there anyone else who would be interested or wants to nominate themselves? Yeah. So, no. All right. So, I have a second. All in favor? No. One, one second. So, I think we're good. All in right. favor? All in favor? Aye. Right. Okay. Right. Here you're up. Yes. We covered that. Okay. All right, now we're down to development and project updates. And Harold did touch on some of that. I just didn't know which one to add to that. Um, he did most of it. He did, he did a pretty good job. Did yeah. you have on? No, 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 no he did not. So, Bill John Main. Um, yeah, no, I, so, sorry for my tardiness. I was covering the maintenance meeting. I was going to be the maintenance meeting mm -hmm. for Patrick because he's out today, and I lost track of time as we started talking about snow and the cup. <laughs> um, so, um, phase five is underway at Village on Bain. So it's level three on the north side, and they're working on interior uh, stairwells, the um, first floor uh, gathering space should be open. They're just doing some uh, final touches on that area, but hopefully the uh, community manager office space will be on soon, and Kat will be moving back from there. Um, and we, you know, it's kind of become a well-oiled machine. There's still always little hiccups there, there, and people moving in and out um, from the units to the hotel and back. But it mostly has been going really well. Um, Pinker is working on the back parking lot now, which is much overdue when we did that anyway because of all the drainage issues. So those will all get fixed. Um, no more ice skating right in the back. Um, just an update in case you hear about it, but, you know, parking. Where people are going to park in the meantime is a big topic, and Katie uh, Pong worked really closely with LDBA to get permits for those people who have an ADA placard, or people who don't have an ADA placard, but who had an ADA or reserve spot in the brain of the parking lot. Um, if they have a reasonable accommodation, um, she got them a permit to that um, six street little lot there in between the scope and the John Main, and then anyone with an ADA. Here, can park in any space within the city without regard to time limits. So um, I think that's worked really well. Um, haven't heard much on my end from anyone about it. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of going well. I think I have a meeting this week with Katie. She might have just canceled the call on relocation and catching up. So um, that's kind of the update on the BLM. You guys can talk about this on the program. And then Zinnia. Are you talking about Zinnia? Basics. Basics. So back in the village, at least enough for that one, we have backgrounds for that. So back in the village, I don't know if any of you guys have been able to see um, what's going on, but the thing that was fascinating to me has been how we're painting the brick. Mm -hmm. Yep, the yeah, last day. That's, yeah. and it's, a lot of it is done. It looks really nice. So, yeah. I mean, they're hand painting each in the original yeah. brick. Yeah. yeah. So they're they're staining the brick a darker red, which kind of makes it look more youthful. If the building exterior can look youthful, <laughs> um, I think that that like pale pink original brick was just not the best, and now it looks a little bit more like it fits in with downtown, long gone with all the red brick. 
Um, the siding is getting replaced and painted as well. The siding looks really pretty. So like the, 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 the nice blue. Um, yeah, the exterior of the building is looking really good. It's so, the interior is too, but you're dealing with the front part. So, I've seen a couple of the inside units, uh, which I think are nice. And of course, it's a matter of maintenance too. You have changed them. But um, they've really done that inside. Uh, so I'm sure you guys will have a look at the house for you. Yes. It's all set up and you get to see it. But yeah, it's, it's coming along. Yeah. It really pretty fast. If anyone wants it to work, let me know. I can change that. Uh, it's sort of will be green or Yeah. It's nice to get in there when it's on construction. And uh, see the change. Um, Linzinia, like you said, we're accepting applicants, going through the process with the and the and HP, um, and background checks. It's, um, you know, permanent support housing is tricky. It's hard. Like dealing with a population that is hard to house, and so um, that comes with some partner and you know, in our, our role in the, the project was a special limited partner, so they got the tax benefit of LHA being part, but we're also the third party property manager. So, um, try to balance needs and goals. You know, we were there to protect the property and um, make sure it's operating well and protect the community and all that. And then we have the competing um, goals of our service providers to house people. So, working through that has been um, <coughs> It's gone well, and we, Catherine from Element has hired a consultant for TSH that helps guide some of the conversations, helps work through some of the other kinks. Um, we have a trauma informed training coming up in September, ahead of Lisa in October. Um, Jonna has been um, Jonna's been working really hard. She's the property manager at the suites. who's going to be also working at Zania. She's back from her accident. Yes. Um, and we said she was in a pretty bad car accident. And she's back. Um, she's working really hard, doing a great job, trying to keep up with all of the actual work in her team. It's really great, helping cover the suites, uh, caseload, and work um, that she's needing to focus on her. So we also um, have the security team, which is really great. That really helps um, keep calls for service low while we're working through. Yeah. Is that the security conflict? So I was talking about this, that, that um, so that we're going to stick with basically. Like, I'm not going to say permanently, but it's, it's not just like a gap filler. Right. Yeah, we, so have a, we have a year long contract with okay. them that yeah. is you know, optional to renew every year. But, um, for the suites, it's really difficult because we don't have a budget for it. Um, Kendra was here at the maker. She has heartburn about that because we don't. We don't really have a budget for it, but it's such a need. Um, it provides so much peace of mind and, and coverage that we'll, we're going to have to figure out how to make that work. There will be 24-hour security at Zinnia. Ours is not 24 hours. Ours is only half the hour on weekends. Right. Um, Zinnia will have 24-hour security, but that is uh, paid for by their supportive housing services budget. So that's not something LHA is paying for over there. And it may end up being a different company. Um, we're still working through that with um, the other. So that's what's going on. So, yeah. And that kind of leads into our next item, number six. Hopefully, there's no other development questions. So, is it in the service? So, this MOU kind of came out of um, those guided conversations that we've been having with. Element, Boulder Shelter for the Homeless, and NHP with um, Bo Simone, our, the consultant that Element has hired. And NHP, Boulder Shelter for the Homeless, and, and LHA all have different agreements with Catherine, Element, the owner um, of City in any way. But this was really comes out of the conversations that we've had of, of double checking and ensuring that everybody understands what their role is and really delineating our goals and works. So it does reference those original agreements. Nothing changes those. This is, you know, this is just a recapture of our understanding. Um, if there's any anything in this agreement that would differ from our property management agreement, the property management agreement will 
uh, control, which I'm sure is a carry something that you would catch and want to know about. Um, so it's not changing any of our any of our expectations. Um, it might add expectations, but it shouldn't. Um, and so this is just something that came out of all these conversations. We all went through this for several weeks, um, reviewing and updating. And so it really is just an MOU, like mm -hmm. our understanding of each other's roles. And so we're going to be bringing this to the board to sign. Um, any questions or comments about it? I have a couple of questions, but I, I, I may have missed something somewhere. But is recovery cafe still included in this? Or is so recovery cafe? Recovery cafe might go and work at, at Zenia when it's open, um, but currently they're not involved in the deal structure. So MHP is there as the voucher, the voucher administrator for the state, the state housing vouchers. And then Boulder Shelter for the Homeless is the service provider. And they're also funneling the clients through the local peace conferencing or the one that I've done. And so we're all working together to get to that process, and that's the, the approvals that we're doing now. Um, but yeah, Recovery Cafe is not part of, part of this deal. Currently, they might end up coming in after we're at the running uh, and doing some additional work at Zinnia as a partner to LHA. That would be something we bring in. Um, yeah, they don't office out of the suites, uh, but they might do their recovery circles, you know, on site. They come in on site to the suites to do some events, uh, but they office out of their own building. Um, that uh, for historical purposes, Melissa, we were trying to figure out a way for the recovery cafe to build an office on site at, next to the suites or semi connected to the building. And it, we worked through, I think, the utility issues, but it, they they wouldn't be able to subordinate like, the mortgage that they would have to get, would have to subordinate to anything that we have on the property with our lender investor, and they weren't willing to do that, and our lender investor wouldn't budge on that. Requirements, so it wasn't going to be financially feasible for them to get that. I've done that right there. Um, so, what we did instead is we have an agreement with Recovery Cafe to come in and provide services at the suites, future Zinnia, and possibly even other, other properties as, as it goes. Okay. Well, my other question had to do with the um, 60 days on the termination day. I'm just wondering if. The service provider decided to terminate. Did that give you enough time to pull in another service provider? Um, so, which is not a role that under general terms under five? Under five. Five general terms, and then number two, termination. I'm just curious. I mean, if the service provider could say, do so much, I so, was wondering if that gave you enough time. If they terminated this, MOU, they still have an agreement with, with Element that they would have to abide by. I, I think that that language is in here, but it's really it's going to go back to our original agreements with the owner. So if Boulder Shelter for the Homeless were to pull out of the deal, they'd have to work on that with Catherine and Element. Um, and so then the, this, they would pull out of this MOU as a result of that. I don't think there's ever a situation where this MOU would be turned over that the other agreements wouldn't. So, um, yeah, that, that's actually an element issue that they would have to solve for. Um, I highly doubt that that will happen. I think any little, like, no. yeah. I think any little like, conflict or cause of action, I mean, like she said, would be based on the independent contract, or not independent, but the contracts between the parties. Yeah. I don't think that, in my understanding, is that this sort of document is almost just for coherence yeah. and not so much being like as you know according to X, Y, and Z term here we're you know gonna pull out I mean I think that's right. Yeah, MOUs are generally just they're they're sort of contract light. Yeah. A judge it. might yeah. might just decide if you had an MOU with someone and there was money and services involved, a judge would likely be like, this yeah. is not an MOU, it's a contract. Right. Like right. you're calling it an MOU though. By definition in terms it's a contract. This right. is more of just that that yeah. general understanding. So it spells out the terms to me. Yeah. 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 It's really, yeah. 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 It's really, really good. Yeah. Both of them actually really drafted this. They did a really great job. Yeah. Um, anybody else have any more questions? That was all the wrong thing. 
And then the next document that we have that the board's going to be signing is um, the subcontract award with DU. This was something that started a while ago. We signed an MOU with DU through 2023. Actually, it's just 2022. Oh, so back in 2022, that we signed with them so that they could apply for this grant. They were awarded the grant. Um, from what I understand, they started doing the work. We never signed the contract. So it's a contract? Essentially, yes. They've been doing the work. They want to pay us. They have to close out their grant, so we need to get this signed. So that's the mad dash to get this done. Um, we had it updated to replace any references to Lisa since she's no longer here, and then removed from the scope of work um, the line item where they were going to request police reports. And we just weren't comfortable with that being in there. So they don't actually want client data, identifiable data. They just wanted de identified incident reports, which we already provided to them. Sarah and the team have sent those. Um, so they they've been on they've been doing the work. We want to get paid, so in this case they're going to pay us six grand. So, but um, Harold as the ED doesn't actually have authority to sign this contract. It's not something that's always either to him. So it has to go. Um, so we're going to get this signed, send them an invoice, get our six thousand dollars, and then they will close out their grant, get their data, do their analysis, and so to sort of just clean up. Yeah, we can request um, whatever they come up with. They're doing a study on the trauma informed design, in this case, the lack thereof at the suites, and how that can affect tenants. Um, I think that that information is really beneficial. I mean, we know what works with trauma informed design, but it's good to know what are the pain points for people. In the building, we already know the doors and the locks and on, so we're going to trust that with the RFP. Now that we got the grant money, we were awarded two hundred thousand dollars from CDBG funds uh, from the city to replace all the doors and the hardware at suites. There's big gaps in all the doors, and it creates some paranoia. Noise coming in, light coming in. You know, some people don't like that. They they feel that people can hear them. Um, and then, of course, because it's a hotel, when you leave the, the unit, the door locks on that. So we have a lot of lockouts at the suites. And if we could get a, a new hardware system where it doesn't do that, it's just the deadbolt, that will um, relieve a lot of uh, pressure on the tenants and also our on-call team after hours. Um, so we'll all work on that. And the trick with those doors is because they're not standard, um, apartment doors that go wider. It's going to be able to replace all the, the door casings. So we're going to start working on that RFP and get that going. So you'll probably see that in the next meeting or two. So does that intercom system work any better? Are we doing anything about that? I don't know about the intercom system. We can use that at all. It's sweet? Yeah. I don't know. Everyone's unit has their own phone number. LHA pays for a phone and internet through Maslight. So every every tenant can't have a phone. Not every tenant chooses to. Mm -hmm. So usually they knock on the door if they eat them. Or they come through the lobby pretty often. They're not the kind of shelter at home. Zinnia will have an intercom system that they will communicate with the tenants. Because at Zinnia, um, if you have a resident, if a resident has a guest, they have to check in with security, they can leave their ID, and then security will call and let the tenant know that their guest is there. So a lot more sort of locked down than the suites is. So. I'm just sitting right here. Okay, update on operations. Sorry, that's what I'm seeing.
sorry, so number eight, is that right? So like eight A. So a little, yeah, lost. Okay, there we go. Unless some of us think the brakes are calling like a gold pen every time it's so sort of this should be the one time you get something. Um, well, speaking a little bit volume, but we're having ice cream parties this month. Um, Kaiser is throwing ice cream parties at other companies where I have the administration sales. That one has been well attended? Yes. <laughs> um, so, one thing I think I want to ask you, I don't love this report because it doesn't really tell you which units like if, if we have four vacants, but two get filled and two more from vacant, we just, it just looks like we always have four vacants. Mm -hmm. So it makes it look like we're just not filling units. Right. So what information from this would you like to see? Would you like to see which units are vacant and what the status is of each of them? Do you want that granular detail, or is this okay as long as I communicate kind of what's happening at the property level? And I was thinking that at one time we sort of did get that when we were bigger. Oh, it came out of yard and that those reports are not the easiest to read, which I think is why Lisa started creating this one. Um, I think if, which I think was a problem in the past, we weren't really turning our units, we weren't really pulling vacants, we weren't making an effort to do so years ago. Um, with Lisa coming on board, it got better. But I don't, if, if we had a situation where units were just sitting, unless you knew which unit it was underneath them, that's contamination of bad move outs, it just looked like we always had units. So it, it could be a tool that you know someone's looking, and so there's more pressure. So you can go through something that should try to find Yeah, I think that we used to get that. Yeah, we used to get the um, days vacant. Um, which I think I think that's nice to have because then you can kind of get an idea of how many days, you know, how many months or even years the place is vacant. Because that's rent that's not coming in. Right. Yeah. So, lost rent, lost yeah. revenue, potentially. Yeah. Okay. I I just think when you're responsible to present data to a board, you tend to do more about it. So, which we're doing, but I'd like to be able to say, this is this is working, or this is this is our pain points. This is like the B two unit, for example, has been down well over a year. Um, what does that mean for us? Well, lost revenue for sure. But now we have the investor recap wanting us to recapture tax credits, and we're going to have to pay for the tax credits that are lost. So it kind of puts pressure back on the operational side to be doing stuff to report to you that there's going to change. Otherwise, you're just hearing the same thing every month. And there's no um, delays of accountability. So it's a way to create accountability, which I think is something that we So for a normal move out um, that's not a myth or anything like that, what kind of turnaround time should we expect? 60 days? 30 10. days? 10. 10 days. If someone moved out of their apartment mm -hmm. and left it not trashed, mm -hmm. empty, mm -hmm. there's no reason why it should take a month. Because that's what we've been looking at a month, not longer. Yes. Yeah, so you're saying 10 days for a month? I think that was Lisa's goal and she started. 10 days. What should we do? To, to bring it up to rentable status yeah. within that 10 days. So if it's if it's an easy term, the person was you know responsible, kept their unit clean, didn't damage it, it's a cleaning. Maybe you replace a floor piece of something that scratched or something like that. Maybe it needs to be painted. There's a lot of a lot of people like to hang stuff on the walls because like the man strips and they get stuck. Although you know get scratched with furniture. So maybe you need paint. But really Coat of paint, clean the unit, shouldn't take long. Um, what we have been seeing is more of the situation where people pass, either in the unit or in somewhere else, their stuff is left, 
we have to get either family members or someone to come clean it out, or we have to do it ourselves, or um, or they just leave it trashed. If we're looking at the suites, that's a special one. All those units usually need longer than ten weeks. Who does the work? Our maintenance team. They they clean, or we can have the custodial team come in and clean. So. Yes, so you, in my opinion, unit turns and emergency work orders are always at, are always at the same level of duty depending on which one is happening. Um, if it's an emergency maintenance item, we need to fix it. It's you know, a damaged unit. And then, but otherwise, unit turns should be the focus if there's units that are vacant. And then, filling in the other time with um, maintenance and work orders as they come in. And then, of course, reasonable accommodations can help out with this. So what's the sort of time frame? I know you know about this too. Um, for maybe not a meth unit, but a, not an easy move out, like a, the one where we're actually pushing for eviction or whatnot. Like, what, what is that time frame? I, and I know it's up in the air, and there's been so many changes with the law and with um, how those proceedings are working. But just in terms of what we're talking about now with occupancy, like. What what does that time period look like? I think I would say thirty to sixty days. Thirty to sixty days. Okay. Because we like from the, when we first take it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So now you have this formal action. Because technically, if it's a action. super egregious act, we could do a ten day notice. To, if it's like safety issues, we could sure. do a ten day notice to vacate. Okay. Most of the time, you're going to be doing a thirty day. So they've got a month okay. either to change like a, to to come into compliance. Okay. Or pay the rent, and then at that point, if it's if it's okay, they haven't paid the rent for thirty days. We give them the demand. They've got thirty more days to kind of earn. At that point, we initiate an eviction. You're looking at another thirty, 30 days, sixty days. Yeah, and then the sheriff's office has a backlog. Well, sure, three weeks. Yeah, that assumes that you get the eviction. So I mean, it could be five, five bucks. Like there's yeah, a way to I don't know, I'm literally just brainstorming, but include that in some way in like occupancy too, just in terms of no, nope, not personal information about you know people or the specifics of evictions, but maybe just that I don't I don't know if it's important time enough. Time. Yeah, if it's important enough to even you know put here with our occupancy reports, but it might explain. So that's yeah. Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, we might. The one that we did, the last eviction we did, is not a stipulation that gave them additional time to move out. Uh, it it kind of depends on the situation. That one was unique. We weren't evicting them at any point. That was just someone graduating from the. I mean, we, we don't evict for much other than that, or like substantial violations. So, yeah, it might, it might not even be something that we might have to do, right? Or I still want to do an idea. If we're having one, we can. So, thankfully, not doing evictions a lot. Yeah, no, that's great. <laughs> so, we work for a while. Hmm? Seems like we work for a while. Yeah, I think yes. I think when we started getting back in units and doing inspections, there were some where people had not been paying. Maybe they were relying on the additional funds that were coming in at the county level, and they weren't using that money that they were getting to pay their rent. They used it for something else potentially. So, but I think that broke the law. There's a there's a wait list for each property. Um, so we we call, we go down the line as they come go on the wait list, and then if they um, have to update their income or assets, we do that, and then we see if they qualify. If they qualify, we forward that information to the property manager. The property manager sets up a meeting or a showing, and they go through that process. So it's oh, it's ten days. It's, it's yeah, it's not a requirement, but. Um, but it's nice, we don't want to lose out on that, but we are. Oh, it's a waiting list. 
independence. Um, so yeah, which kind of people stay on? I thought you guys are there to do it. Diana's been actively going through the wait list and purging mm-hmm. if they don't qualify, like if their income is <coughs> two times. Mm-hmm. And they're required to update us on their income changes, so we're not calling them and asking, hey, is your income changed? Come on, update our list. I mean, they're supposed to proactively do that, so she's going through the list and seeing that they don't have two times the rent. She's taking them off the whole list. And she's kind of actively doing that, that wait list management. Um, we're going to be probably moving wait list management down to the property level so that the property manager is going to be that. It's just going to make it faster. We've already um, started having them do their own background checks. So that will make things go by a little bit faster. So we're getting back into ownership um, responsibility for the property. Um, so, have, are you up? Uh, do you have enough maintenance and custodial staff now? Or are you still looking at hiring room for all of the two Kinder has added a maintenance person and in the BOM budget, which means we hire and we'll take Patrick off the properties and at the LHA level. Um, so that, I mean, really, he shouldn't have to be doing supervisor duties plus being in charge of the property similar to how we, we didn't think it was working and so was the regional property manager and property managing Aspens. Mm-hmm. Part of the job is going to get ignored or you know it's just never going to be important because you've got too much to get. Yeah. So um, that's something we're working on is uh, another thing is for the OM and of course we'll be the SEM when it comes online. We'll have its own property manager and staff full time. Because multi-family is a different beast than supervising. And uh, originally we were looking at sharing with Brightstone Lodge, which created issues with the level 202 crack budgets, and HUD having to have a say in that. It's just easier to budget their own. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we're looking at staffing up over time. I want to look at and see if a third custodian, you know, we're adding another property that's going to need a third custodian. Custodial staff that maybe new lights as doing unit turns a little bit more deeper clean for the unit turns to make that easier. Um, our other option is to contract out for unit turn cleans, which may or may not be cheaper. We don't have the data yet, but we're collecting that information for unit turns to see if that's something we can do. So, as the Meadows neighborhood, we have B2, which is the meth unit. Um, going to be looking at draining our reserves to get that unit out of our hands and sitting for over here. Um, it needs, I, I walked it a couple weeks ago, it's, it's basically empty. There's no flooring, some of the HVAC floor returns are the same. Um, it's been painted, but it needs trim, the appliances need to be moved back in, it needs a couple, um, the vanities and bathroom need to be put in, so there's lots of Lots of stuff needed there, and then we have four pending to make ready that are in the process of unit terms. One is the unit that was evicted, which has significant damage. It needs new flooring, painting, um, just a lot of community and attention. They lived there for 11 years, so that's a lot of wear and tear on the unit. So just need to bring it up to um, to, to standard now, and then. Um, Lisa, the unit that Lisa lived in, she was the manager. We we're just replacing carpet in that one and then doing a clean. That one will be up and ready. We have another unit where somebody transferred to an ADA unit from theirs, and so we're just doing a, a unit turn on that one. And then there's one more unit that is getting turned, and we just need carpet. Lots of issues on the washers and dryers in those because they're, the, they're they're finally coming to the end of their lifespan from when it was built, and so we're we're seeing an increase in those costs. Um, otherwise, hopefully we get those um, filled because that is our least we have the least wiggle room in that budget because there's so few units compared to the other properties. So when you are with that um, lease wizard, are you actually renting that out, or are you going to have a manager with you? Manager's not interested. So, uh, so yeah, we're going to rent that one out. 
And then as the middle senior, we have two vacants. One is 311. It's very direct, so we're working through the wait list on that. Getting that one in. And then the other one is via 111, which is down here under the back of the observations. Um, that resident passed away. Uh, we cleaned out the unit of all their belongings finally, but the uh, cat urine damage is extensive in the flooring, so I think we're going to need to clean this all the flooring. Which sucks because we're going to end up replacing the flooring in that whole project anyway. Yeah. Uh, we'll fight. Say love you. Um, Fall River, we have two vacants working through the wait list to fill. Um, and those, I think, those vacants are future vacants. Like, two people have given notice um, and will be moving at this month. So, those will be quick units. We can see our newest maintenance tech does a fabulous job up there. Um, getting units flipped really quickly. Um, Spring Creek, we have five, two pending make ready, one just, just vacated, one notice given, and one is ready to rent. Hearthstone is fully leased. The lodge um, is fully leased technically right now, but we need to do an eviction on a resident who passed. Um, there's no family, no next of kin, so we can't just go in and take their stuff and, and where to be on that sheet the eviction process. Um, for a month. So we posted that demand. The ones can obviously respond, um, and then we'll have to go to court. And we need to check in with our attorney to see if there's any administrative process we can do to make that pass. So it seems like a waste of we see how much we need to do that. And then this week, we have six vacant that are MHP. One is a meth unit, three are pending make ready, and two recently vacated. Um, the meth unit. That's the one down here. Um, we just don't have the funds, so we have to look at reserves to see if we can put, start doing the to work on that one. And that one's just been so hot that we'll probably have to do a for the day. So we're dealing with affecting your side, right? How much would you hundred k to hundred k? So what is your major be doing about your maintenance? Because it seems like you have a separate reserve. So. I'm glad you asked. It, within the last two months, we got approval from the state to move from a combination of local case conferencing in one home and we can to just local case conferencing. And with that, the applicant pool has significantly increased. So we actually have a few people moving in to those units. Um, it's just pending clearance from clients. And then um, they, think two weeks ago, they had their HQS inspections. So they're moving in. It's happening. We're going to hopefully see less vacancy in the future. Sure. Um, so the, the, about the case conferencing? Yeah. So local case conferencing is the Boulder County uh, it's, it's basically the, the local shelter List where people are being coordinated, coordinated entry. Right. Right. <laughs> the coordinated entry at the local level here in Boulder County. That's through the city, Boulder County, um, our shelters here, Hope, uh, or Shelter for the Homeless. Those are all being fed through that system. And then there's one home, which is the one out of Denver, which takes people from all over the state. They all get put in that coordinated entry system, they register, and then their name comes up on the list. They get the option of, hey, there's a unit in Longmont, do you want to move there? They can decline, um, and then they go back to the back of the list. So the problem with the one home is we get a lot of people who have zero connection to this area, and either they don't want to live here, so they decline, and then we have to wait for another person's name to get called up, or they come and they have no support. And so they're not successful in establishing a home here in Boulder County. Um, we found out with the suites, we weren't being able to fill units fast enough, and it was causing issues. Um, and so we, we asked the state if we could change our tenant selection plan to switch to 100% local case conferencing through the other county public And so with that, we're getting a lot more uh, candidates who want to stay in, in Boulder County, who have connections here, who you know, have a community, a sense of community, or their care providers are here, their uh, case management is here. So they're much more likely to accept the unit and to run. So that's what's changed for the suites, and we're seeing the full action review. Um, so
suites. Well, we talked about that. Village on Main. Um, we have we have 15 vacants uh, that just happened because we either weren't filling units, knowing that the construction was coming, or um, people have opted not to come back, or they moved before the construction started. And we've been doing a really great job on uh, filling those. So we've got four vacant units left of the 15, and that's we've pretty much used all of them up within the last month and a half. Just for for history's sake, when we started doing the closing the financials and underwriting on this project, it was a situation where at VOM historically people were not putting the right units based on their AMI. Um, they were not increasing rents at Village on Main, Village Place as it was. And so what we found was that if we were to underwrite the full chaffa limit, rent limits of this project, none of the people currently live there would be able to afford to come back. And so we were very conservative when we underwrote the financials for this project. So that has given us a little bit of room where we we could ask for up to the line tech rent limit per unit. What we have found is that people just don't have the income to meet those rents. So we're able to kind of keep the rents on the lower end. We've been advertising them for higher than what they were, but not quite the chapter max. And so we've we've been able to get people in. Um, it's nice that they get a brand new remodel unit, and it's not fifteen hundred dollars because nobody on a fixed income could afford that. They didn't qualify, and so Diana was finding that it's really hard to go wait list because one out of twenty could maybe qualify, and they still didn't like the idea of paying that much. Anymore. So we have been able to be a little bit more flexible with the rent amounts, which has helped us lease it up. Ultimately, at the end of the day, we need to give our investor um, all the units fully leased and done in order to get our tax credits. So that's been our focus, two part on doing the recertifications for the people who are already there, and then also with filling those vacants. So um, we're almost there. We've got four left. Um, and in Briarwood, we have two vacant. They were um, they were kind of made ready a little while ago, but then. Um, our maintenance team and the property manager were just not happy with the the units just didn't smell good. Um, it just looked a little worn. So Patrick has been replacing the flooring and he's going through replacing all the um, receptacles and plates to just make it look a little nicer. Um, and then we'll hopefully get those two rented. Um, we are working through the wait on that one as well. So once we get those two, um, prior will be fully released, which is nice. Sort of the, uh, it's twelve twenty seven. Yeah, that's actually twelve twenty eight Main Street. That's the yeah, end where the veterans is right there on the way. Just be blind. It's right next to between the liquor store and Easy Park. <laughs> the front side looks like a commercial building. It's the back side has the units on it, kind of in a L shape. So, so how many of those units over there are veterans? Because we talked about that at one time when they thought they were going to buy the place, and I don't know when they're and now they're not going to buy it. And so, I don't know. I don't know if they made that like, So that's not a focus. Yeah. yeah. So focus. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I have some like high of the sky ideas on what I'd like to do with that property. There's a big question of county for um, housing for individuals with development. Um, the Walsh Home and Walsh Home Disabilities, and it's possible that we, there's vouchers from the state for that, and probably we have vouchers from the region of the this time, so um, if that were something we could do in the future, I think that would be great because, it's, you know, the units are on the first floor of our ADA, there's the, we've got the brand new ADA access there, and then there's, there's parking, um, they're small and manageable. Um, and then when the Veterans Community Project vacates the commercial space, we could rent it to um, service providers for it. So it could end up being its own like, hub. Um, there's limits on what you can do with IDD because if, if they're getting a Medicare voucher for those services, you only have so many people, otherwise it turns into like congregate living, and that's not allowed. Um, and then the A11 vouchers has a limit on 25% vouchers on the project. So. 
which makes sense to do. So we, if we were to fill it with PDBs and then some state vouchers, we could that that property would be cash flow. Who knows? That's a future one because there is no designated ID. And next item is what property updates. Um, landscaping is much better than it used to be. Okay, I think he hung up. Yeah, I hung up on my phone. Okay. Landscaping is better. Um, we're working with EDI to kind of had a meeting with them. <laughs> Great to mobile home in a nice way. Um, but they appreciated having the opportunity to fix whatever we were pressuring them. Um, they're walking Spring Creek this week, I think, to start talking about the rock piles, what it's going to cost to move the rocks, and where Patrick and I met and talked about where we would want to see some of that rock um, end up. And we've been doing a better job on the weeds. It's been a hot topic for a long time. So, glad to see that. So all the property is doing that. We've got the city forestry is working on cutting down and on ash floors on the properties and removing junipers or cutting back junipers that are pain. Um, and the EDI is going to do the same. I think we're going to help them in. No, we're going we're gonna to cut down the junipers of the streets that are along that avenue that people are hiding stuff and hiding in. Um, so that there's better visual uh, sight lines. Um, we're all, uh, Randy also wanted to get rid of all the lounger chairs at the suites because we were using the stack up and some actually got into our unit and we did that um, last month. So we're getting rid of those because nobody's using them and we want them to work out the team. They're cool, so they're very cool. So we're going to do it. Nobody has a team here. Um, that's, that's pretty. That's, that's, that's some extensive work. Right? And then there's a dog involved. So, a dog got in there too. So, um, and then, like I said, they're doing some coffee, coffee conversations this month. Kaiser's coming in to do ice cream parties for the residents. Um, so now that Lisa's not doing that, she hasn't been with all of them, right? Or all of them. Who's, are we? So property managers have taken ownership of their contact for protections, which is something right. they always wanted. Okay. Um, you know, it's yeah, they they expressed a desire to do more at their property and have more ownership and authority over decision making. And I am happy to give them that's how it should be. Um, so I come to some if I think it's gonna be a hot topic or contentious, for example, um, we have to do some net remediation in some of our bathrooms for the properties. And so we'll be talking to residents about the importance of making sure you don't let people in behind you and calling the police if there's someone on the property that you suspect should not be there. Um, and so I'll be at probably talking conversations this week. Well, some of them. Do we have a, um, I should have this, but do we have a conference of this of the dates coming up like, on our website or, okay. They get included in the LHA newsletter. Okay. Awesome. Um, I can just check that out. And or I can. Our name was great at that one, but obviously I can have Diana I can have Diana come with me and like to you. Sure. That would be great. On your call there, you're not required to be there, but if there's three of them, there's three of them tomorrow. Okay. Okay. I'll talk with you then. Three of them. Two tomorrow. Two tomorrow. The first one, one while I've been trying to lodge together. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they yeah. Off, um, alternate yeah. properties. And then suites is tomorrow. Part so lodge and suites is tomorrow. And I also attend most of those as well. Yeah. Right, and okay, that's right. What about the room? There's three or all of them. All of them need it. Um, Kendra's out this week. So when she gets back, um, I'll probably start, we're looking at budget for next year, but I think we need the budgeting for that this year. So I want to see what we have and start getting contract up for that. Um, I know that there was talk about renting a lift and our team doing it, but I just don't think that that's feasible. We're not, I mean, we're 
even if we were fully staffed, that's a big job. That would be a for everyone on this situation. So uh, we did get a quote. Um, it seemed reasonable. So I want to see what budget we have left for that. Um, and then, of course, the rocks, the new rocks at all the properties. I get started on that finally before the snow comes because I don't want that sitting in the parking lots anymore. So it's sort of like with the window cleaning, it was always like, well, what time of year do you do it? To be honest, and it, it, was, it was a weather concern. It's like, well, there's always weather, right? Yeah. So <coughs> that comes up at one property almost all the time, and then the rods come up at one property all the time. So I mean, it's the same thing. It's not the same. Yeah. Yeah. So I get it done. Because I can't see every window. Issue, but it's also just been a capacity issue. Um, you know, now that I'm here, it's gotten better. Because Carol said that even with Lisa vacating a little, it's that I have now absorbed the stress of the two jobs. And it's not been, it's been good for me because I've had to learn property management that I would not have otherwise learned fast. Um, so, double edged sword. <laughs> Yeah, because they've got the equipment, they've got the insurance, and they've got the equipment. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's got to do the um, So then, I think that's really all I have for property updates. Um, like I mentioned, I, I have the maintenance team putting together their ideas of what worked, what didn't last year for snow removal. I think the snow removal plans <coughs> weren't well thought out. It was sort of like, oh, it's for the snow, we should probably figure out what we're going to do. Because they weren't going to use a contractor anymore. So we're, we're getting ahead of the game um, for snow removal. And financial review, I, don't, I can't talk about that. The spreadsheets. So I know that Kendra is actively working on the hard and Mosh budget for, for those properties. Um, and then we're actively working on insurance. We changed over our insurance carrier, working on adding some additional coverages that might be required for ascent and or just are required a good thing to have, such as the um, tax credit recapture. That's apparently an insurance coverage you can have, which we, we now have because we're going to have. With, with and no math coverage, right? No math coverage. Yeah. Um, yeah. I won't. I won't try to butcher these gadgets. One day I'll be better at it. Well, no. Health and safety in the budget every year, which will probably have to increase at every property. Which the new thing is the bathrooms. We didn't anticipate having to not to be our bathrooms and the tests came back. It's, um, so it's opposite of a pregnancy test when we do the AccuMath test. If you see a line, there's little to no math. If you don't see a line, you're the line. And then all the properties have all the bathrooms have. You know the public bathrooms you talk about inside the units of the community cooking on the bathrooms. I don't. I don't want to say the properties just yet because the residents have been asking. They've been closed and they didn't know why. We didn't know how much and what it's going to take. So we'll be getting those those properties today and tomorrow. Just to be clear, you're talking about just the test that you know we always do yeah. for these, not like the metal detectors giving us alerts or anything. Because they're not in the bathrooms in the units, right? They're what? not in. They're just in vestibules or hallways right now. Okay, gotcha. Um, this, this was a situation where at one property a homeless person followed someone into into the property and then trashed the bathroom. And the other property we were alerted because during the cleaning our staff found the like and so we were obligated to test. Sure. We test all of them. We tested all of them. And two of the two of three came back on. So is there a time frame you have to work on it because you have a lawsuit? Um, 
I don't think there's a time frame because no one's accessing those bathrooms right now. They're locked and you know, not working. So, but we want to get them up and up. But I need to check with them. Well, I'm sure I'm like a bulky conversation. Somebody else is going to be 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 is there any chance we can get a code or something so we're not staying outside forever? Yes. I'll, um, <laughs> um, yeah, we can get you a code. Yeah, yeah we're just going to kind of stand out there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> just trying to be helpful. I know. Clearly, I was not. Uh, all right, come on, health and safety. Uh, let's see. Cameras, I just will get to hear me again about cameras. So, Village on Main, um, they are going to be probably the first property we'll have our new cameras up and running due to where they are in this location. Um, I believe that those have been ordered or are getting ordered and then will be installed, I would say, within the next two to three weeks. The city, um, and that is kind of, we're, we're on the tails of the city updating all of our cameras, so we're using, and just to include you in this, so um, leadership wants all of our cameras on like the same platform, so um, and they're going to be obviously going to be access control for people, you know, city staff, public safety, but if there's an issue going on at one of the LHA properties, um, you know, leadership would, would like public safety to be able to see that real time or be able to review it um, just so there's everyone everyone has access to it right so um, needless to say city um, all of our park our cameras in the parks are being changed out due to um, things that we found in the cameras that we do not want in our systems um, some Chinese hardware so we got new cameras, and they're being put in city parks as we speak. And so once that is complete, hopefully Village on May will be up and running um, and getting those put in. As far as the other five properties that qualify for the cameras with the CBDG funding that we have to spend on it. Um, yeah, that's nice. Yes. Ask another neighborhood, not seniors, we already have cameras in, new cameras, which eventually may have to be changed out if we can't get it added to, if it doesn't speak to our, the system that we're going to be going to. Um, Fall River, Spring Creek, Hearthstone, and Lodge. And the suites in Briarwood are not included for now, but we're, we're going to have to be looking at that in the future for budgeting, especially for the suites. We do have cameras there now um, that are useful, but we want all, everything on the same platform. So <clears throat> we'll probably wait a little bit on that one. Um, so yes, I can't wait to not talk about cameras. <laughs> it's been a long time, <laughs> a long time. Um, yeah. And that's just due to a lot of things changing um, within the city and type of cameras, who we want to work with, et cetera. Well, that just started off, I think, I recall it, with the fact that we couldn't accept any Chinese cards or new caveat. The guy said we could have started all over again with that. We did. We were not with a lot of Chinese cards. Well, apparently, access is the type of camera that we're going with. So they do not so comfortable. Um, map detectors, we, um, we just received 22 of them from our vendor. So to fill you in on map detectors, so there's a vendor in New Zealand that we uh, found over a year ago and they sent us some test um, detectors to utilize. Um, the goal for map detectors is to be more proactive to not have to demo a full unit, right? It's not 
we're not using this to leverage um, any arrests or anything like that. It's basically preventative for the property. Um, we have a map addendum that's all ready to go once we start using these in the units. So the resident will understand that they're there, they're just going to tilt and tamper uh, alert on it. I can see all of the ones we have. We have three right now that I'm monitoring. Um, mm -hmm. So an alert goes off, it's sent to my email, and uh, we did get more, mostly for city bathrooms. We have some that we may be flexing into LHA properties. Um, Carol's having me look right now into putting one in Village on Main in a unit that um, has not been rented yet, so I'm working with Lauren and Kat, and I did get some clarity from our vendor. Um, I know we didn't replace any, any drywall. We painted. Um, basically, he advises to use that cleaning. Um, I'll get into that in a minute, and we should be good to go. So there's a, a company out of Broomfield that um, actually provides cleaning supplies for the military, for um, governments, and it, it can basically remove meth, fentanyl, anthrax. It's, it's a cleaning product. So we got a free sample of it, and I'm hoping it's used in the So that's but that's a heroin question. Do you want to clean the bathrooms? Do you want to clean? Do you want, do you want, want to put one of these up in the village on there? Um, I'm cheaper than that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm with you, and we can just purchase more, right? I mean, um, so our vendor set us, basically connected us with this um, company in, in Broomfield, and we have been playing um, tag or it to meet, but um, we were able to get a sample of the police supply. So, um, and now it says, I this great model. I know. So basically, that it um, turns the meth into. Yeah. It seems the what can we do that though? I bet like the process is pretty strict, right? In terms of cleaning. Yeah. What you gotta so, do. So like, I mean, I can't imagine. We just will, going in and spraying it like bleach. Sorry, I didn't mean no, to no, cut no, off your question. We, we would only do it at a low level and have someone have a, a mat respirator mask on and then, you know, PPE. I mean, like, that'd be sufficient for that, it. That's so not basically that's the on track to do it hard. Okay. That's what I'm told. So, I mean, technically, the, the onus is on you to clean and remediate to the, the state standards if you yes. get it tested with an industrial hygienist. Right. So when we go in and we do an aftermath test, and if there's there's some mess but not a lot, it might not rise to the level of needing an industrial cleaning right. or remediation, but we want to clean it to the best we can. So sure. It's zero. So, so, the, so this would help with yes. that without having to do the full remediation. We wouldn't use it on like the one at the suites that needs a full rebuild. Okay. No amount of cleaning is going to help that. And in fact, when we put the bids out to recycle, they determine depending on the level. If the cleaning is necessary or if it's like a full mm -hmm. Yeah, just to you know, keep ourselves protected. Yes. Well, safety yeah. um, I'm so sorry. No, 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 I did. Oh, I'm so sorry. Right. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. 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 yeah, so I kind of live So it's just something that you, it's just like a chemical. It's a spray and it turns the meth into a biodegradable thing. So, wow. Yeah. yeah. So we'll, you know, keep monitoring that and try this cleaning. Maybe we just use that spray bottle for one of the bathrooms. That we need they're not that big. I thought they were like white. Yeah. Or no line at all, sorry. Oh, see, yeah. I always get it confused. Well, it'd be worth to, to try it out and see where we you know, get with it. Because I don't think we even try to clean it on the other side. Oh, because I need to do that first. Yeah. Maybe. I'll look at the structure. I'll go over yeah, we okay. um, as far as uh, calls for service on properties, we've been, I would say the Q word, a um, few pickups here and there, but nothing has been steady. And not a lot of issues. Not a lot of resident issues with each other. Um, 
So that's all I have. I, but now that we maybe have full staff, getting the, the fire the fire drills set up for Spring Creek and Fall River, uh, John had requested to wait until he had some help. So, so we had a new assistant team in the year's work and with the probation. Um, that's right. um, and it wasn't due to us, it was nothing to do with LJ. It was a situation where I was told they never put their job. They just came and went to the see how they liked it. They were on mm -hmm. vacation to LJ <laughs> and then decided they wanted to go back to that job. Which has its own implications and issues. And I've already spoken to our development partner over the past couple of years. I have a interest. I have made two offers for assistant community manager at the Open Ventures Center. Um, one person is going to start on Monday, 19th, um, and the other one will start on the other one. So we'll be backfilling that position and having some cross training happening. Um, and with all vacancies, anytime someone leaves, it's an opportunity to say, is this job, like, do we want to fill it the way it is? Do we want to make some changes, some shifts in workload, what expectations? So we're having those conversations now. And then there's a third person I made an offer to that we're working with. So, so hopefully we'll be fully staffed on our property management side soon. And then the is turnover. Turnover's been um, an, an interesting thing since I started. Anytime I, I think anytime someone in management, new in management comes in, people choose to leave or not, you know, long term. Um, there's always those shifts. So, you know, we've had two people resign. We've also promoted two people. Um, we've promoted Patrick back to his position, we have a person retired, but my first week, and that was Dave, who was on the maintenance team. Um, you know, so you can see it's the impression of the job. <coughs> Property management is a high turnover job. They are on the front lines dealing with people. Often people have issues. I mean, these are a vulnerable population, whether it's our traditional affordable housing or the suites, everyone has financial issues, no one to struggles, everyone's due to travel. Um, and I would add, it, it's just not LHA. That's just, yeah, that's just the property management. Possible. I see that. If, if the turnover runs right now, I'm not going to see that in my contacts because the turnover is so bad. Yeah. 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 Well, I think it's everywhere because you, know, you can't go into the store and without seeing somebody get there at time for So, yeah, it's like. It's a high stress job. It's a thankless job sometimes. I mean, now that I've been sitting in Lisa's position, there's a, it, for every thank you you're doing wonderful you get, you get about 35 who suck and don't look really terrible. So, um, and unfortunately, public service doesn't pay well. The, one thing that the private sector has going for them is they get bonuses, but they get bonuses because uh, they skim, they cut corners, they, you know, not everyone does, I'm not saying every private property manager does that, but we don't have the, we don't have the budget capacity to offer things like bonuses and incentives. I wish we did, I hope we get there one day, but, um, you know, the retention of, of staff is a, is a concern. Um, I think we, there's a lot of benefits to working for LHA in the city. Um, one thing that I'm actively trying to work on is getting us fully staffed so that everybody has a little breathing room and can have a little bit of us. Well, I think the fact that you're giving the property managers more autonomy in their jobs is really going to give them more ownership for them. They're going to feel like this is my way. Yeah. Because otherwise they have to go, okay, well, I have to raise that up to the next level to answer your question. And that never ever made sense to me. So, yeah. Yeah. the time questions to yeah. Yeah. answer. Yeah. I've been really interested in the property managers this year all the time and doing copies instead of some management. Um, I think 
They love when Harold comes. Mm -hmm. They like when we come. Yeah, yeah. they like when we come. Um, and of course, they love when we so. Um, but for me, it's more like the person. I want I want them to have a good relationship with their property manager. I want them to feel like they can go to their property manager. Um, it it has felt like adversarial for a while, um, but I think that's changing. I think the, the communication is I feel like they can talk with the way now. And they sort of kind of monitor, I've noticed that they've sort of kind of started monitoring each other. You know, if somebody gets a little bit carried away, then we have somebody else that kind of pulls them back a little bit. So I think that's really great, too. Yeah. And we're actually holding people accountable. I think for a long time we weren't. I just got away with things. Um, it's a delicate balance that we want to keep people house and conserve them, but at the same time, like, have an obligation to make sure that we're abiding by their lease and that they're not causing problems for the community. And so we're being a little bit more strict on the um, lease violations and demands. It also ties into what we've been talking about for a year. All this legislation change as landlords, now we have to do that because we can't just not be there for a lease. We have to have costs. And so we actually have to track these things. So it's in our best interest as a landlord if we do want to non renew for someone because they are continually causing problems, we have that option. We might not exercise it, but we have the that's been the direction given to us by our legal counsel is document everything. And the way we have to do that is with these violations. At the copy of conversations? Yeah. On the bill, as I understand, even the other ones, I don't know, I mean, you know, it's the only question I have here, but I think it's going to have a reduction in attendance. That's because you're getting answers. Yeah. I mean, it, from what I experienced, is that this copy of conversations was the same conversation every month. Yeah. And then that was very frustrating for staff. And there weren't any answers to the questions, you know. If I've asked the question, it's kind of nice to have an answer there rather than say, what do you know about it? Yeah. Um, so, Sarah, did you have some help? I did not. Have you had any questions for me? Do you want to set some empty detectors in the bathrooms? Oh, yeah. Meth detectors in the bathrooms? Yeah. <laughs> they can be the that too. But so that's that would that be a conversation. Oh, in the community? Yeah. yeah it We're actually good. putting them in the public, yeah. public city restrooms. So it wouldn't be to catch anyone, it would just be to monitor so that yeah. it doesn't need to be worked out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an insurance mm -hmm. type decision. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's what we hope for the city bathrooms. We're going to have signs up and we'll see. Um, we do have good news, and this is a, a pretty huge update for Fall River and Spray Creek. We've had horrible cell service there for many years. Um, Next Light basically worked on a proposal for us to um, financially, I mean, they're, they're paying quite a bit for us and we're not having to come up with much money at all. Um, Pay some ongoing costs, but really cheap. Yeah. So they're the bus, that's it. Yeah. So they're going to be putting basically I don't want to call it a cell booster, but they're putting it's essentially their equipment in to each level of the building. And that will allow for Wi-Fi. Yeah, Wi-Fi calling only. So people won't be able to get on with their tablets or anything like that. Um, it's going to be really like restricted to just cell phones, and it doesn't work for flip phones, right? So, um, they and they they uh, offered to come in and do the education for these folks. So we'll have to definitely advertise that really, you know, really well, so we get good attendance to those, and then have the information with the managers. And um, you know, they offered to do a QR code. You know, the manager would probably have to help 
residents do that if they come to training. But um, I don't know. I mean, can we give the folks a comment? Yeah, we just, just John had to cut the couch out of the budget. Well, which no one wanted anyway. Okay. Yeah. It's not just those two facilities, because I live up there in the south. So oh, yeah. It's the whole neighborhood. It's my whole area. Yeah, it is the whole neighborhood up there, so I don't know how they fix that. This is our, our it's more than a band aid. Yeah, yeah. But it's going to be a lot cheaper than what we were looking at. It's like a couple, like a couple thousand dollars for more property that's not one time cost, and then we get more building. Two to three hundred parts of the property, which we'll just hold them for budget. So we need to talk to make sure we understand that cost thing. So, and it's like a tiered system. So, like Sarah was saying, the residents have limited um, use of it to just cell phones, yeah. and um, public safety has some more bandwidth with the system, mm -hmm. and then management has a lot more bandwidth, um, so that we can have that stream of communication. Anything that you guys can do that makes them happy, just use it for the steps. Yeah. Well, and it's, it really has been a safety issue. Yeah. Because people can't get a hold of higher safety and they can't get a building sometimes and they don't know where people are and all that. So we don't want we don't want something bad to happen to our clients. It's not our fault, but we wanna we wanna get a solution. Great. Okay. Um, any other business? I really push my button. Okay. None. Okay, so any need a motion to turn. Okay, Glenn. Okay. Richard. Okay. All right. We'll see you next week.